The Byte Show is listener supported at thebyteshow.com. Hello, everybody. This is George Ann Hughes, and this is The Byte Show. And we're really blessed to have Joseph P. Farrell with us. Joseph is the author of many, many books. And you can find his website at this address, Giza, G-I-Z-A, death, D-E-A-T-H, star, S-T-A-R, dot com, Giza, death, star, dot com. And on that website, there is a surprise, surprise, a PayPal button. <laughs> and I ask that those of you who appreciate uh, Joseph Farrell's work, please make use of the PayPal button. We've got to keep him in research materials, and they are not cheap. Not the kind of research that he does. So please do that. And you can also find Joseph at the Bite Show. Go to uh, his name on uh, the in the library, Joseph Farrell. And there's a little twinkle star there. And um, click on it. And all of the uh, audio files that Joseph and I have worked on over the years are right there. And they're all free. And I ask, please, that you help keep all the audio files free. Um, it, here, here. It, yeah, it does oh, cost. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it does cost to produce these and to pay the the bills. And um, I appreciate those of you who have helped out. And it's this is an ongoing thing. So God bless everybody. <laughs> and Joseph, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know whether to put this under Babylon's Banksters or uh, the social engineering because I want to talk about uh, the debt god. Okay. <laughs> aha. Yes, aha. <laughs> and you said mm-hmm. that in other files that this is a debt that can't be paid off. Right. But didn't Jesus pay off this debt? Well, that's... <laughs> That is the classical medieval Western uh, church's teaching. Um, The idea, it's it's something that that my co-author and I discussed, uh, Dr. DeHart, uh, in Grid of the Gods. And the idea comes, George Ann, from a medieval uh, Western theologian, uh, Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book in, in 1081, I think it was 1081, uh, called Cur Deus Homo, Why the God-Man, yeah. is what the Latin means. And it's it's very illustrative and, and informative for our purposes okay. that he begins this treatise by saying, and I'm, I'm quoting as closely as I can to... Uh, off the top of my head to what he says at the very beginning and these are very important so it's it's very important for people to pay close attention to what he says okay he says quote in fine leaving christ altogether out of view as if nothing had ever been known to him or about him mm-hmm. we shall prove by absolute reasons why it is altogether necessary that God had to become man. Okay? Okay. That's the end of the quotation. Okay. Now, if you look at that statement very carefully, what is really shocking and surprising about it is that you would think that a Christian theologian would be beginning his theological process or, or presupposing as a part of his uh, so-called logic mm-hmm. that he would start with Christ yes. as as his starting point. But no, he's starting with something else, all right? Mm-hmm. 
And what he's telling you is, is that what he's starting with are what he regards as, quote, absolute reasons. All right? So in other words, there is something else present in his thinking that is driving the entire work. And, and we cite it, um, at great length. And the reason we cited it at great length, I have to tell this kind of personal vignette, is that this particular treatise was something that long bothered Dr. DeHart and I, and we we discussed yeah. it, you know, pretty much all the time uh, whenever we got together to talk. Oh, to be a fly on your wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, those conversations have been pretty... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Something else that he eventually gets around to in in this treatise is an argument that runs somewhat like the following summary. Okay. When mankind in the Bible, in the stories of the fall, yeah. when he sins, because he has sinned against the will of an infinite God, uh-huh. all right, and and as I'm telling this logic, I want people to stop and think of all of the moral and rational problems now, that start to pop up as you listen to this. You mean he sinned because he wasn't obedient? He, yes, he okay. sinned because he wasn't obedient and because that was against an infinite God. Okay. The, the moral uh, debt, and that is quite literally what it becomes in in Anselm's thinking. Mankind, therefore, owes an infinitely, uh, an infinite debt or an infinite justice or an infinite penalty, whatever you wish to call it, to God. All right? Or to reverse the logic somewhat, you have an infinite God that is infinitely pissed off over a an infraction of a finite creature. Yes. All right. Now, if you if you stop and really consider what is going on here, if you if you consider the statement that I just stated, mm-hmm. then you'll discover that wait a minute, what kind of what kind of morality is it that this infinite, all wise, all merciful God would be infinitely pissed off at a minor infraction? Yes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what it amounts to. It doesn't seem like it was very big of him. No, <laughs> but but anyway, but this is this is the uh, quote logic unquote of of Anselm's treatise, the Cur Deus Homo, and because mankind owes this infinite debt, and mankind is a finite creature, mankind can never repay it. Yeah. The only person that could conceivably repay it is God. Yes. Okay? So in in Anselm's uh, rather unique moral logic, what this means is, is that God had to become man mm-hmm. while remaining perfectly God so that as man he could repay the debt, and since he was also God, the debt would be infinitely repaid, and the books would be balanced. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah, yeah wow. <laughs> now, what this does, and the reason the reason that we put it in Grid of the Gods, and the reason that we tied it to, to by deliberate reference to Babylon's banksters, is what it does is it means that God is quite literally a uh, a banker. He's an accountant. Yes. And Christ is the accounting trick. Oh. That balances the books. Oh my All right? goodness! Yes. Now, you know, this is this this becomes more or less the de facto teaching of of Western Christian churches. It yes. should be it should be pointed out, in all fairness, that this this logic was known to the early church fathers, and they had a great deal of difficulty with it. Yes. And, you know, there was there was any number of attempts to try and explain, you know, why is this sacrifice necessary? And none of them ultimately are are terribly uh, pleasing. But Anselm, Anselm kind of summed up this whole idea of a debt and a sacrifice and, and so on and so forth. But the interesting thing is, is that in reproducing the idea that sin requires 
blood and and a debt that has to be repaid. Anselm is really reaching back, of course, into the Old Testament where you find the idea of sacrifice. But there, the problem is, is that once you get into that idea, then you discover that the same logic of debt, of sacrifice, of, of you know, propitiating the angry gods who are pissed off by, by offering them blood, that this idea is really not so much even Judeo-Christian. It's pretty well present in almost every culture in one form or another. Certainly, it's it's present in in the thinking of the Aztecs. You find yeah. the same logic of debt, of sacrifice, of blood, of propitiation. Uh, you know, you're you're making the credit card payments. The only difference, ultimately, if you if you look at the logic carefully, is that the the sacrifice of Christ in in Christian in Western Christian thinking puts an end to all sacrifices precisely because it is an infinite sacrifice, all right? Yeah. Because in Christian teaching, of course, Christ is is the God-man. If you look at the Aztec practice, they keep sacrificing humans. And, yeah. again, it's the same sort of twisted logic. The reason they have to keep sacrificing humans is, of course, the infinite debt idea means that no one individual human sacrifice ever suffices. It's as if you have to keep making your monthly credit card payments on yeah. top of, uh, uh, you know, on top of the altars, uh, sacrificial altars of, of their temples right. in order to, you know, keep the, the angry gods from coming and, and repossessing you. So, <laughs> you know, now, I'm putting it all that way because I'm trying to point out that what you're dealing with here is a kind of... You're dealing with a kind of twisted um, bankster logic. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, this this takes us back once again to, to why is it that we have this connection over and over and over throughout ancient cultures between the temple and the money changers. Right. And I suspect strongly that this whole idea of sacrifice arises at a later period, precisely in the period where you see the emergence of this alliance between various priesthoods and money changers. Wow. All right? Oh. Now, the reason I'm, I'm putting it that way is I've got a bit of news. Um, we are, Dr. DeHart and I, are probably going to finish the book that we're writing together tomorrow. Oh, boy. Yeah. And in this book, we go into the idea of sacrifice a little bit more. Okay. And I, I'm not going to go into details, but, but what is apparent is that at some point in time, the idea of, of sacrifice, which was originally a metaphor for how the world came into existence, was twisted into a metaphor of how we please and propitiate the gods. Who brought it into existence? So, in other words, sacrifice kind of appears to us to originate as a as a kind of uh, analogical, magical act to to uh, mimic the process of creation, and thereby, to a certain extent, to gain power over it and to gain power over the god or gods that were assumed to have brought it into existence, in other words, to propitiate the gods. And it's, again, it's, it's, it's such a twisted logic that, that got them to that point. But it's part and parcel of this idea that, that the world, the physics of the world, so to speak, is a closed system and running down. Yeah. And in order to keep it going, it has to have fresh injections so to speak, and and that's how this whole idea of of sacrifice gets Fresh. started in in my in my thinking right now. And I think when people read this book, I, I have to stress again that when the book comes out next year, it is it is probably the most controversial book uh, that I've ever written, and and certainly probably the most controversial book uh, Doctor DeHart has ever written. But um, sacrifice is a part of it. Um, 
and and again, in our opinion, it's not an original practice because the the whole idea of of debt arises later. Um, and it's interesting that it arises in conjunction with an elite that believes that what should be circulating as money is monetized debt. So you've got yeah. two things you have two things going on. Whenever banksters get into the business of being the sole monopoly of a nation's currency issuance, there can never be enough money in circulation to pay off the interest on the principal. Right. So you are in perpetual debt, and this is exactly the same logic that you find being exercised by the gods, so to speak, in any of these sacrificial systems. So it's no wonder that you see this alliance between the banksters and certain forms, I, I stress this, certain forms of religion, because the underlying conceptions are one and the same. Well... Next question, Joseph. Uh -huh. Wouldn't um, military service be a type of religion? Being, military service? Yes, being that so many men die. It's, and they call it sacrifice. Well, yeah, this, okay, I see. I think I see what your question is. Um, in other words, you're asking, could could we be looking at behind the veneer of certain human activity? Yes. Could we be looking at cover stories for what amounts to an ongoing practice of, of human sacrifice? Yes. In order to make it acceptable and uh, palatable to modern man. Oh, that, you put it so well. <laughs> well. Okay. Well, I think you can make that. Uh, you can make that kind of. Uh, speculative hypothesis. Um, the the reason that that I think that you have to at least entertain it as a hypothesis is multifold. Um, I view you know I view the whole idea of of abortion on demand, where you have millions you know. We were, you know, I'm old enough to remember at least in this country that this was advanced as a as a benefit to women who had been raped and, and conceived as a, as a product of their rape and so yeah. on and so forth. Yeah. But the trouble is, is that the millions and millions of abortions that have been performed since it became legal are far exceeding the number of rape cases. Yeah. They are they are far exceeding you know any real. Uh, explanation that was advanced back at that time yes. and I suspect that hidden behind that decision may have been the idea to reinstitute under covert means the idea of, of bloody human sacrifice and, and the more innocent the life the better you know oh, this has yeah. always this has always been the the grisly brutal logic of um, the grisly brutal logic behind societies that have practiced human sacrifice. They look yes. for virgins, they look for the young, they look for the comparatively innocent. Um, and it, it, the problem there is, you know, so many people that would consider themselves enlightened or progressive will in one breath condemn the Aztec practice of it and, and on the other hand, turn right around and, and defend this out-of-control runaway uh, abortion that we have. Yeah. But I don't think that abortion is the only indicator that there's something else perhaps lurking beneath the grisly logic of, of what's going on. Um, abortion and other methods of population control were, of course, pushed by the elites, yeah. the, the financial elites. And this is something that they've been pushing for quite a long time. Uh, the, the scholar Webster Tarpley has commented that, that the idea that the Earth has a certain population limit or carrying capacity, that's as old as, as the bankers of Venice. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's not a new idea. It's been around for quite a while. So they've been pushing this idea for quite a while, and, and you get into that, and you get into the fact that, that there are some people that say that these elites at the very top are involved in various practices of the occult, and, and you make the connection. The other thing that 
leads me to suspect that there is possibly something behind the the logic of your speculation is that you mean concerning the military the military or or what have you yeah is that there are so many people the world over children in particular that are kidnapped or go missing and never yes. show up again yes uh you know we see tragically we see these cases on television in this country and and other countries in the world where children are just simply abducted and and tragically oftentimes murdered in the most brutal fashions mm -hmm. um the numbers of it suggest to me that that beyond the sick individuals that do this that there may be something else of this nature going on um you know i i i i think that's another possible case where you see it being practiced covertly well the, the military service might yet be another um yeah you know <sighs> the the uh the bloodletting of of the French Revolution I think has certain hallmarks or overtones of definite occult connections to to that practice so yeah I think I think it's quite possible George Ann, that that your question uh, has some merit uh it's but again you're you're asking me to speculate off the top of my head I don't have any particular research back yeah. up any of this at that at this point other than to say that that the numbers the size and scale of of these different things military service um child kidnappings uh the the vast amount of abortion that that's been practiced since it became legalized um all of these things um I, and I'll go further George Ann. okay uh you know we all know of of the grisly cases in in uh the medieval western church and there are even a few instances of of these types of things that took place in the eastern roman empire in the eastern church um we all know of the grisly practice of of the various national inquisitions in europe yes. to literally roast people alive yes for whatever reason uh usually heresy uh you know in, in other words it was a form of of capital punishment of having the wrong thoughts yeah and that's quite literally what it is this is what police. thought control yeah. thought yeah. police and yeah. this is what so scares me in this country and other countries that there are people on both the political left and political right that want to control your thoughts and oh, yeah. and are even making certain statements or thoughts a crime uh you see and that's the slippery slope that leads to roasting people alive at the stake. Yes. Now, I'm mentioning this because the again, the size and scale of it in in Western Europe um suggests to me and has always suggested to me not only the the holocausts of the Old Testament, in other words, you know, a burnt, a, a literal burnt offering but it the size and scale of it has always suggested to me and again I have no evidence or proof of this it's a suspicion mm -hmm. that there may have been a hidden covert reason behind all of this uh all of these burnings again to disguise the practice of human sacrifice under the guise of ridding the, the civilized world of impious heresy and heretics all right yeah. yeah and again you know people may think of of uh, certain famous cases of of certain so-called heretics that were burnt at the stake uh, Giordano Bruno and people like that but we have to remember that that the whole thing really got a huge start with the Albigensian crusade when there were quite literally thousands of people put to death in this fashion uh by by the the French and and at the instigation of of the papacy. Oh. Yeah, and yeah. the the logic again George Ann um <clears throat> the logic of it at the time was of course to to purge Europe of of wrong thinking people of of heresy. And 
the connection of this activity with the church and uh, therefore with people claiming the authority of God and thinking they were doing a pleasing work to God. Um, again, you see the logic of yeah. the sacrifice is implicit in what they were doing. So, uh, yeah, I think I think there is perhaps some merit to exploring that hypothesis. Um, but it would take, uh, I have to be honest, it would take a lot of, of research to do properly and it would, it would take a lot of... Uh, to some very obscure sources. May we pause? Yes. Okay, we're back. <laughs> uh, we hope we're back. <laughs> yeah, we hope. Oh, oh goodness. Well, Joseph, uh -huh. they're, right now they're talking about uh, they have already sent troops into uh, Uganda. Yes, and, yes. and there, there is a huge problem in Uganda with this guy. Uh, yes, I can't remember his name, but he's been in control of the uh, rebel forces there, and they have stolen thousands of yes. children, forcing them to be child soldiers, forcing yes. them into sex slavery, and cutting off body parts. Yeah. And, and just uh, killing th th thousands of people with hatchets, I mean uh, machetes. Yes, yes. Um, he is known to be a twisted type of Christian prophet. Yeah. He is known to be um, very, very violent. Yes. Uh, this kind of activity... Uh, it's also been suggested that uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, the word is out that if you sacrifice a child, yes. you'll, you'll get prosperity. Yes. Now, does that sound like the prosperity movement? Well, uh -huh. you know, it's the, the whole, this is, this is my point in, in um, bringing into consideration different social manifestations yes. of the logic behind bloody sacrifice and this is why I I mentioned in particular the inquisitions um, yeah it's not surprising that you it, to me anyway it's not surprising that you see a twisted Christian and certainly I'm not again I'm not trying to point the fingers at Christians at large or in general but it is not surprising to me, anyway, to yeah. see this kind of thing reemerge because there is, as long as you have present within the religion itself a connection to what I can only qualify as, as kind of the moral schizophrenia of, of the Yahweh character in the yeah. Old Testament, yeah. as long as you have a connection to that, you are always going to have somebody who, in their twisted logic, will find that as a rationalization or justification for that kind of practice. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the disturbing problem. Um, I, I'm you know, I'm actually blogging in the coming week about uh the situation there in Uganda because um again you find the emergence of the idea of sacrifice coupled to the sacrifice of the most innocent people yeah. possible that yeah. you can find and that's children. So again, uh none of this surprises me. Um, I'm certainly I, I'm certainly horrified at it. I mean I, I can't yeah. even find I can't even find the words to express um, to express everything that, that I think is going on with all of this. Um I'm hoping, and, and uh, my co-author, uh, Dr. DeHart, and I are hoping to do some books and e-books about these types of subjects because... Um, well, they, we need it. <laughs> well, I think we do. Um, the real problem is getting people to see how the logic of this is is embedded, is is programmed into 
if, particularly if, if they're uh, religious people from one of those three religions, um, it's, it's sort of embedded or programmed into those religions themselves. Yes. And it's it's very simple once you see it, but it, the real problem is is getting people to be able to see it. Yeah. When you're the problem, George Ann, is when your final authority is a book. Yeah. Whatever that book may be, but when your final authority is a book. And the book is full of morally contradictory behavior and statements. Mm -hmm. Then, yeah, you you've got a a a program there for disaster. Yes. You you've got a program there for uh, twisted and sick people to do twisted and sick things yeah. in, in the name of their god. And uh, it's it's. It's high time that it, it that it really be addressed squarely. And and again, uh, Doctor DeHart and I do talk about this aspect of things very briefly in in this book that that we're finishing up, um, because it's a part of a much bigger story. Oh yeah. And, and uh, I you know I I hope I hope my explanations. You kind of caught me off guard with the subject matter yeah. tonight, actually, but. I hope my explanations are making some sort of sense. Um, well, Joseph, without without having a lot of research put into the subject. Yes, they, well, they do make sense, and I want to point out that in the all through the Old Testament, this Yahweh uh, is teaching the Israelites, the Hebrews, to be uh, war warriors. Yes. And yes. to go kill everything. Yeah. Man, woman, child, animal, everything. And then there's a change. He um, becomes punishing because they don't obey the slightest little thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I find that schizophrenic. Uh, it... it and people say, well, he went and had them kill all those uh, people because they were uh, genetically different. Mm -hmm. um, if they were so different, then why in numbers does uh, Moses give, uh, tell the soldiers, you may have the young girls? Yeah, it's that again. We we've talked about that before. That whole that uh, I, I agree with you that that the behavior at best is morally schizophrenic, yeah. and you know, and and I don't want to hear from a bunch of people that are have their noses buried in their Bibles because folks, you know, I, I did my PhD in theology. There's there's not an argument that I don't know that that you can find. Yeah. Um, the problem is, is you don't, re you aren't going to make an argument until you realize the moral contradiction. Yes. Um, the the argument about genetic purity bothers me because this is something that began to enter theology, at least in modern times, with the emergence of genetics and and the possibility then that this was a kind of a loose confirmation, at least broadly, mm -hmm. of the story of the Nephilim in, in Genesis chapter 6. Yeah. And, okay, if you grant that for the sake of argument, yes, I, I think you, I think your, your point is well taken, because uh, if you're slaughtering people on the basis of genetic impurity, then, then what is, what's the control group? Yeah. What's the standard of purity? Yeah. Well, you'll notice in those stories that there really isn't any any real good definition of what that purity is supposed to be. Right. And if the purity is such that, okay, you can slaughter everybody who has had sex and keep the ones who haven't. <laughs> and that is what the words in the book of Numbers state. Well, I, I know, I know. The, you know, again, it, it, the bottom line for me, George Ann, is precisely, it's, it's a kind of, uh, what you said, it's a kind of moral schizophrenia. Yes. Terribly. Oh, my goodness. Well, is this debt ever paid off, Joseph? I mean, 
are the books ever cleared? Well, in Anselm's teaching, yeah, because in in the classic medieval Christian teaching, yeah, you've got an infinite debt, but Christ is is the God Man. So as God, He's infinite, and He can pay an infinite debt. And as man, since He's man, it's mankind that owes the debt. So voila, you've got the perfect solution. But the underlying problem is is where does this logic of sacrifice come from? Yes. And is it really moral? Well, uh, the story about Noah and after the flood, and he builds an altar and he has a barbecue, and the gods say, ooh, yummy, we like that smell. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, the smell of burning flesh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, again, yeah, I, I, you get no argument from me. Th that story bothers me. Ooh. Well, it bothers me, too. It bothers me, too. Stories like that were precisely the stories that bothered the, the early Christian Gnostics, which is why they, for the most part, for one reason or another, or, and in one fashion or another, rejected most of the Old Testament because they found these types of things morally, morally abhorrent. Yes. So, you know, it's not a new phenomenon, this, this idea of, of questioning the morality of what you read in those books. Um, the problem for classical Christian doctrine uh -huh. is that the church, be it Roman Catholic or Anglican, Lutheran, what have you, uh, the church has always made the connection between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New. Mm hmm and that's precisely where and how that what I what I've been calling the the programmed in schizophrenia that you find in in these twisted people like this guy in Uganda comes from. Yes. So as long as as long as that is in place, you you always run the danger of having these kinds of of results. Because inevitably, there's going to be someone come along and says that we need to take this stuff literally, or we need to go back to organizing society around God's laws, be it Sharia law, or be it rabbinical law, or what have you, or, uh, you know, Calvin's Geneva, yeah. <laughs> you know? or Oliver Cromwell's England. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh, Lord. Yeah. Oh, God forbid. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it seems like we are moving, many are moving in a backward fashion. Mm -hmm. They're moving deeper and deeper into the matrix. And mm -hmm. the rest of us are climbing out of that matrix. Well, it is, it is, a, it is I think, a sign of the times. I think it is clear that there is a portion of society moving more deeply into kind of fundamentalist reactions against the modern world. Yeah. I think that there's equally a kind of a fundamentalism of what I call the the new age. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and by that I I would mean the kind of militant revolutionary uh, type of thinking that you found with with the Bolsheviks, that you found with. Uh, the French Revolution during the phase of the terror. Oh, dear. Um, you know, I, I find some disturbing parallels with what's going on at on that pole of society. Oh. There are there are people, <coughs> excuse me, people waking up. I think to the fact that those polarities themselves are kind of <coughs> products in the in a mirror like reflection are kind of products of the the inherent moral schizophrenia of of the culture in which they were formed. In other words, given that that this Western culture is a kind of a, a Judeo Christian culture, yes, then those revolutionary movements are the flip side of the coin. Mm -hmm. There are people, I think, waking up and realizing that this is a very old program and that there's really no logical reason or rational necessity to follow either one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look at the Arab Spring, mm -hmm. uh, for an example. Mm -hmm. uh, they want freedom. 
Yeah, they want freedom, and notice that in many of these cases, the the movements were either co-opted yeah. by fundamentalists who who want to live under the glories of Sharia law. Yeah. And again, for for the Western uh, person, that would mean like living in in John Calvin's Geneva or Oliver Cromwell's England. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And much worse, as a matter of fact, than than those two uh, theocracies. But. Um, that's effectively what you see going on, and particularly in in America, George Ann, you find uh, a certain strain of of, uh, for want of a better expression, the Baptist revivalist religion that yes. that wants to put America under a similar sort of of regime, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I'm as equally dubiously skeptical of them well, as at, I am of any fundamentalism. Look at what that turkey said about um, uh, Mitt Romney's religion. Yes, I know. I, I have oh. I have a, a blog coming up about, <laughs> about that as a matter of fact. Oh my in, gosh. In the coming week. Um, How uncalled for. Well, it was totally uncalled for, of course, but you know, when, when you're a self-appoint, when, when you're following a form of the religion that's only about 500 years old yeah. and have already deluded yourself that this is a form of, of historic Christianity, <laughs> then, yeah, it, it, Mitt Romney and the Pope are fair game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, wow. um, it, it's just, it, it, more than anything else, George Ann, what disturbs me is is that these people... If you read their writings, they do go right to the Old Testament for the basis of how they philosophize a society should be organized. I mean, come on. Yeah. You cannot possibly be more medieval. <laughs> yeah. And they are. And they are. Oh, yes. oh my gosh, Joseph. Gee. Well. And, you know, let's not just pick on them. There are similar movements within within Judaism, yeah, and, well, yes. and particularly in the state of Israel. We've certainly seen similar movements within Islam. Mm-hmm. The, you know, the the programming here is within the... the uh, in those, It's within those religions themselves. Because of that inherent contradiction, you're always going to have, so long as you you have that programming, you're always going to have the possibility that those types of fundamentalisms can arise. Oh, gosh. Well, in uh, Judaism, there's uh, the the uh, rabbi goes yeah. around with a chicken and sprinkles the blood on uh, people, and it's supposed to take their sins into the chicken. I mean, how, what kind of magic is that? Well, we have a word for it in the English language, voodoo. Yeah, it is right. <laughs> That's right. But yeah, it's it's um, it's getting to the point. I think we're at one of those periods of history that comes along about once every five hundred years. Oh dear. And we're we're at a point where we are reaching a what I call a, a fork in the road, a, a cultural fork in the road. Mm-hmm. There are going to be some who choose the fork of remaining in their, with their noses buried in their sacred texts. Yeah. And they will become increasingly reactionary and increasingly irrelevant as their reactionary responses increase. Yeah. Um. And then there will be those that follow the other fork, and, and that fork has has a fork within it of those who want to impose the new view by force. You know, they've made similar attempts in the past with communist Russia and, and earlier with the French Revolution yeah. to do that. And there will be those who recognize that if you if you accept the... Ancient, most ancient metaphors of the creation of the cosmos and how we got here. There's no need for any imposition of a sort of uh, special revealed truth or a party ideology or anything of the sort. Oh my 
goodness. Yeah, we are we are at a real cultural crisis point. Yes, we are, and I I don't know if many people can view it in in its sum from that vantage point, Joseph. That they they um, most you, people can't. Well, what do you call it? They they uh, look at this little part and that little part and this little part over here mm-hmm. instead of the whole shebang. Right. You know. Right. Uh, well, most people can't. Um, and I think why is that? Well, a big part of it again goes to the influence of of these religions on Western culture. Um, they have had a profoundly good influence, and they have had profoundly bad influence. Right. Um, it's it's due to that fact, I think, that most people can't. But I, you know, I'm increasingly amazed at how many people are, particularly within within the various churches, waking up because the old stock answers are simply no longer satisfying. Right. I get emails from people all the time, uh, either attacking me vehemently. Or saying, yeah, I've been kind of quietly thinking the same things myself, but I've been afraid to ask my pastor because I know what he's already going to say. Yeah, that, and, yeah. You know, so <laughs> in other words, um, people are getting tired of of the same old, same old, and they're looking for deep, deep answers. Yes, um, and that's encouraging. It is encouraging in one way, yes, but you know, I think we're seeing. I think most people have these these uh, protests that have spread around the world. Mm-hmm. I think people are misunderstanding the spiritual nature of what's going on. Yeah. Everyone is attempting to read it as a political and cultural phenomenon, and it certainly is those things. Uh, they're trying to read it as a phenomenon of frustration over the world financial system, and it's certainly that. Yeah. But again, we have to go back to the fact that of what we opened this conversation with and that is the deep connection between these closed systems and ponzi schemes of monetized debt mm-hmm. and the religions that have always been associated with that idea yes so in other words if you look much deeper you're what you're really looking at i think is a spiritual phenomenon mm. and the old answers uh, are not making any sense to people anymore. Right. But most people, I don't think, have uh, have enough basis to know where to look for answers. That, I think, is the real problem. And that means that these kinds of movements can all too easily be co-opted, co-opted yes. and all too easily be led by the nose by a demagogue who steps onto the scene and looks and speaks charismatically enough to take control of them. Yeah. That's, that's what scares me about this situation. Mm. Because, of course, the last time we had a demagogue like that come along and take control of the situation, well, we had World War II happen. Well, I've seen uh, protesters, their signs say, oh, bring back communism, uh, yeah. God bless Marx. Uh, <laughs> right. I mean, they're, they're very ignorant Yes. of what they are doing, yeah. and that is scary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the 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 level of stupidity. Yes. Is is astounding. Um, I'm glad you said it. Well, it is stupid. I yes. mean, you you cannot look at any communist state and see a state that has been successful or has been mindful of basic human rights. Right. It, it, it's an impossibility. Communism is nothing but the empowering of the elite, the elite, yes. to do what whatsoever they please. Yeah. And uh, communism, far more than Nazism, was was a very deadly uh, ideology to to the Russian people, to the Chinese people, uh, any anywhere it's been practiced. So you know these people are just um, just plain stupid. But in in grasping at things like that, they are showing the fact that what we're looking at is a spiritual phenomenon. It is a spiritual phenomenon. And that's why I say we're at a crossroads. We have people that will 
go forward from this point in their lives and either get themselves into religion or forms of mysticism or forms of fundamentalism on the one hand, or they will get themselves into the mysticism of an ideology like communism. Yeah. That's what we're seeing. Mm. And I think people all too soon forget that the communists, if you didn't agree with them, they had uh, mental institutions, and they would institutionalize you and experiment on you and yep. feed you drugs yep. and totally break you. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Can you address that a little bit, Joseph? Well, that practice went on primarily in the Soviet Union yes. and in their so-called psychiatric hospitals. And... Uh, it was it was nothing but uh, an excuse to find human experimental subjects on which to test techniques of, of brainwashing, mind manipulation, so on and so forth. But yes, they essentially what they did is is they tortured people yeah. and, until their spirit was totally broken. But they found an amazing thing. They found people like Alexander Zolzhenitsyn, yeah. who you know actually told his communist captors, who were mystified at why he was so stubbornly resisting them, he basically told them, well, you've taken everything away from me. I have nothing else to lose. Yeah. So in other words, this, this is the paradox of tyranny. The more tyrannies crack down, the more people are restive. Yeah. So, you know, the good news is, in the long term, these elites always fail. They have always failed. They've had to pick up and move shop elsewhere and then act like they've they've changed their ways and, you know, so on and so forth until they get people to go along with them again. The problem now is is and this is what makes this period in, in human history so unique. The problem now is is there's nowhere else on the surface of the planet for them to run. Yes. <laughs> And the other problem is, is that the world, for the first time in its history, is really, truly wired in to every part. Yeah. News travels instantaneously from India to Indonesia to Indiana. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's truly, for the first time, by dint of the technology, it's a world in which one part can know pretty much everything about what's going on in the part halfway around the world. So, again, for the first time in human history, you've got a truly global civilization. Yeah. Well, they can unplug it, too. <laughs> only with great difficulty and only to their own detriment. That's the problem. This is a unique situation in, in world history. The only thing that the the closest thing, George Ann, that I think this period of history resembles is all of those myths from very ancient times about the Tower of Babel. Oh my goodness, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We're threatening their power. We're threatening the power. Right. <laughs> right. So what's, what was the solution back then? Well, we better go down there and scramble their tongues. We better go. In other words, we better go down there and get them all stirred up against each other. Yeah. Yeah. And that is what they, they're so good at doing. I mean, mm -hmm. um, look at the, the black against white, mm -hmm. Joseph. And that kind of resolved itself. And now it's a, it's Hispanic. Mexican mm -hmm. against white. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got to have a boogeyman. They've got to have um, somebody they can point at. Mm -hmm. um, and they 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 really do use those things. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Mm. In a closed system, this is a very port important point of social engineering to remember. 
that when you're in a closed system of finance and physics, you must have a social space. Let me repeat this. In a closed system of physics or finance, you must have a social space in which truth is separated from error, light from darkness, believer from infidel, yeah, orthodox from heretic, yeah, and on and on we could go. Yeah, if you're a heretic, we'll send you to the firing squad. <laughs> oh, gee. You know Florida mm-hmm. is floating a bill to uh, bring back firing squads? Yeah, I saw that. Oh, gee. <laughs> more ways to kill people, uh, more efficient. No, it's uh, just the return of barbarism. Yeah, yes, very well said. Yes, yes, it is. It's and I bet you he's got a Bible verse to back it up. Oh, probably. Probably. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Barbarian. Uh, oh, yes, yes, Joseph. And it is so shameful. Mm-hmm. It is just shameful. Well, yeah, in a, in a system of justice where you can never be absolutely certain yeah. of the guilt or innocence of an accused person. Well, yeah. l- look at what they did to Troy Davis. Um, yeah, that was very disturbing to me. But. Y- yes. Yes. Well, gosh. <laughs> you know, the Muslim religion has an awful lot in common with the Yahweh character. Well, in 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 the opinion of of my co-author and I, it's uh, it's version 3.0. In other words, you've got Yahwism uh, version 1.0, and you've got Yahwism version 2.0, and then you've got Yahwism version 3.0. Yeah. Hmm. Boy. <laughs> oh, Joseph. We are very sitting on pins and needles, waiting for your new book to come out. And we are. Uh, I'm just uh, very, very excited about it. And the e-books that you talk about, can you tell us more about that? Well, what we're planning to do are a series of e-books on... And and we're still kind of in the discussion stage, so you know this this may change. But we're planning to do a series of ebooks on various manifestations of of this apocalyptic mentality. Yeah. Because it's always a hallmark of these kinds of ideologies that divide the social space into light and darkness. Mm-hmm. Is always a hallmark of those kinds of ideologies that they look toward some future fulfillment when their ideology triumphs over all others and everybody lives happily ever after. You mean like uh, the coming, of, the second coming of Christ? I mean, I mean more than that. I mean not only like the second coming of Christ, but like the coming of the Jewish Messiah, like the coming of the Imam Mahdi, like the coming in communism of the final state of global communism. Yeah. Because that's the same thing. It's a secularized version of certain versions of of Christian eschatology that say that the kingdom of God will occur when the church triumphs. Oh dear. And that, incidentally, was kind of the thinking behind Oliver Cromwell. You see? So, in other words, you're looking at, you know, peel the layers back. Something may look totally secular and totally non-religious, but when you look at the techniques of engineering, social engineering that it practices, it's nothing but religion under a different guise. Joseph, how did all this... B.S. get started. I truly think that there was a how to put it. <laughs> I, I don't want to. I don't want to give away the plot here. Um, okay. I truly think that there was a time when the basic program, as it were, the default setting, was to 
to a situation where the social space was not divided. Okay? Okay. So I'm going back to that metaphor. Okay. At a later point, it's because the social space was not divided that that humanity was a threat to somebody. Yes. Okay? And it had to be reprogrammed so that it would not become a threat again. Oh, wow. And that's basically what happened. Oh, my gosh. Now, every every religion has its own version of that story. Every single one has some version of that story. The real question is, is not so much, in my opinion anyway, not so much whether or not this may have happened, but how it happened, and who, and where, and when. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, the key question. Uh, It's the key question, in my opinion, of uh, ancient history. It's the key question of um, philosophy. I think it's even, to a certain extent, the key question of of archaeology and paleontology and so on and so forth. and of course, most most academics in those disciplines will say I'm just a nut. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't really particularly care what those people think. But, yeah. <laughs> but um, that's that that's it in in a nutshell, Georgian. As I really honestly think that that there was something about humanity and about the social space of humanity that constituted a threat and had to be dealt with. And that's that's really the, the central theme running throughout all versions of, of the Tower of Babel story that, that uh, Dr. DeHart and I sort of touch on in, in Grid of the Gods and then really touch on in, in the upcoming book. Oh, wow. Well, gosh, Joseph. <laughs> you, are, you are amazing. And I agree with what you say um, it it's just so huge it's so huge because it's coming to a head yes. in our time yes and it's coming to a head in our time because as the world is now grasping the technologies yeah. and keys of technologies of future technologies that quite literally are going to transform human life in a radical fashion. That as the world is entering this phase, at the same time, you have a tremendous increase of fundamentalist thinking, not only amongst the major religions, but also amongst the major ideologies. Oh, yeah. Okay? That's why you look at the American political scene, and it is so divided. Yes. And no, one is, no one is willing to budge from their ideological position and think rationally yeah. about the social space in which they live. They are defending their paradigm rather than dealing with reality. Yes. And... This this is a very very unique time in human history. So, in a in a way, that's 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 kind of why we're writing these books. Um, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Yes. But there are people waking up. Yes. Thank God. To the game. That. Yeah. The really important thing now is for everybody to to remember that in these situations it's all too easy for demagogues to come along and to oh, get yeah. followings. Yeah. That's that's really one of the crucial dangers. There's many dangers about these periods of of human history. But that's always been one of them. Mm. My goodness, Joseph. Oh. The last time this happened, George Ann, yeah. was in that period in, in European history that we call the Renaissance and the Reformation. Yeah. And the reason that those movements were not able to be 
silenced by the institutions that had been so successful in silencing similar movements before mm-hmm. was that the two major institutions that did the silencing in previous periods of human history, namely the state, the nation state, mm-hmm. which was at that point in European history a relatively recent creation, all right? Yeah. And the other one was, of course, the church, the papacy. Yeah. All right? The reason why that institution was unsuccessful in stamping out the Renaissance and the Reformation was very simple. It was a technology that suddenly appeared on the scene that threatened its ability to control information. Uh And that technology was, of course, the printing press. Yeah. Yeah. Now look what we have. Yeah. We have the Internet. Mm-hmm. We have the ability, you know, even the Soviets found this out the hard way. You know, the more they clamped down on people in the Soviet Union and the control of information, the more people sat down at their typewriters and just typed out their books and circulated them by hand. Yes. Underground, like Zolzhenitsyn. Yes. So, in other words, the technology is doing the same thing once again. Oh. It's doing the same thing once again. My goodness. And, of course, out of that cultural upheaval in Western Europe, you saw a transformation of the map of Europe. You saw a transformation of the powers of the nation-state yes. vis-a-vis the people. Mm-hmm. You saw you know, all sorts of things happening. It was a huge time of of transition, and we're entering a similar one that's going to make that one pale into insignificance. Yep, I think you're right. Oh, gosh. (laughs) You know, it's scary on one hand, Joseph, but it it is damned exciting on the other. It is. There are good things that can happen, but in order for the good things to happen, I keep going back to what I've said over and over in all of these talks. In order for good things to happen, number one, people have to be responsible unto themselves. Yes. They have to be absolutely 100% filled with love. And and I'm not joking here. This is not a platitude. This is not a pie-in-the-sky thing. Right. And the reason I'm saying that is because, again, this this idea that has arisen within modern physics, that there is a deep connection between consciousness and the physical medium, between the observer and the physical medium. And, And that's the third thing. People have to start getting out of the mode of apocalyptic thinking. Yes. And look at what's happening right now, square, and realize it for what it's it, for what it is. Well, the old paradigms, the old fundamentalisms, will not work. That's right. That is as true for the elites in any capital in the world as it is for the rest of us. The old ways of doing things are not going to be able to work unless they are profoundly modified. That's the danger of these situations because now everybody is waking up to this fact so they're proposing solutions that in many cases are nothing but dressed up versions of the old ways of doing things. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, um... The the matrix concept mm-hmm. with people in there all clamoring after the apocalypse, mm-hmm. uh, the apocalypse, the apocalypse. I don't think they really understand that they are wishing and praying for the death of millions and millions and millions of people. Well, in the religious versions, yes, that's what the apocalypse usually amounts to. Yeah. Um, and in, in most secularist versions. It's like it, praying for mass murder. It, and in most secularist versions, 
that's also what it is. Yeah. There are a few versions of apocalyptic thinking that don't automatically default to mass slaughter. There are a few. The real problem is this apocalyptic thinking, at least in its secular component, is being driven in part by technological considerations and, and so on and so forth. But people have to to look this in the eye. It is going to be... The, the technologies, George Ann, are going to force a confrontation yes. with the traditional religions in a major way. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's going to, to render certain kinds of fundamentalisms obsolete. It really will. But the sad fact is, is I don't think many of those fundamentalisms will go down without some sort of fight. Yeah. Um, and I don't necessarily mean violence. Yeah. But it, there's going to be some sort of uh, widening cultural difference. Yes. Um, that will occur. I mean, the you know, at the point that that we're entering this this technologically unified globe, we're also seeing, as a result of that, we're seeing the cracks and fissures between civilization types becoming more and more apparent. Yes. Well, it's going to come down to the, there's the barbarians and then there's us. I mean... Well, you're sounding like Zbigniew Brzezinski right now. Yes. <laughs> oh. Because that's kind of his world view. Yeah. You know, there's all those barbarians out there, meaning people that aren't of a of a Western European cultural background, and then there's us. Well, I didn't mean it. Yeah, I, I know you didn't, but but in, but in my that. point is, but my point is, it's easy, it's all too easy for anyone to lapse into that kind of thinking. Yes. And it's very easy to see then that this thinking is still the thinking of people like him at the pinnacles of power yes. who have their treatises on geopolitics being read by those in even higher positions of power and able to do something about his ideas. Oh, dear. You see, this, is, bingo. Yeah. The oh, dear says it all. This is the problem. Oh, oh, oh. This is the problem. Well, Joseph, if we have a lot of people that are filled with love and that look with understanding and caring and and love on things and then we have these other groups mm -hmm. that want to kill them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do we have we're going to have conflict yeah <laughs> yeah mm. my goodness Oh. My goodness, Joseph. We're being forced at this time of human history to take a good long look at what it is we think is truly and morally good. Yes. And what it is we think is truly and morally evil. Evil, yeah. What? And the scary thing is, is a lot of people are still going to try and find that answer in their sacred text. In yeah. other words, in things that cannot look at the developments of modern technology with anything more than medieval eyes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Can you sum up a definition of evil? Oh, golly. I mean, that's, that's taxed the greatest philosophers in the world, and you're asking a, a hack from South Dakota to do it. <laughs> and do it on the spur of the moment. Oh, dear. Um, I think one of the, the hallmarks of evil 
is doing something or convincing oneself that doing another human being harm in the name of something that is supposed to contribute to the greater good, Mm -hmm. I think that this is a classic hallmark of evil. Yay. Yay, yay, yay. That's not a definition of it. That's a sign of it. Mm Mm-hmm. And you're right. You're absolutely right. Wow, Joseph, this has been fascinating. And I still haven't decided whether to put it under... Put it under grid of the gods. That or banksters or magic of social engineering. Um, My goodness, it's, it's a huge subject. And it's just awesome how easily we are persuaded into evil. It is. That looks, and you know, evil has a beautiful side to it, or no one would... Would do it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Gosh. (laughs) Oh, my gosh, Joseph, you've done it again. (laughs) Well, I don't know about that. Oh, yes. Well, everybody, go to GizaDeathStar.com. That is Joseph's personal website. Uh, You might sign up for his bid chats. Uh, I hear they are very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, they are. (laughs) (laughs) And they get pretty lively. Yeah, they do. And uh, you can do that at GizaDeathStar.com. And you can buy all of Joseph's books through his website. And, um, gosh. And help George Ann out, too, folks. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. We need it. Uh, we all do. And uh, just God bless you, Joseph, for the you work too. that you're doing. It, it's astounding. Oh, it's just... The world needs you. <laughs> It truly does. The world, the world needs all good people. Yes, yes. But you all have, people of goodwill. You it, have, it needs. you have a good moral compass. Well, I hope so. Yes. Thank my mother for that. <laughs> this is Georgian Hughes with Joseph Farrell signing off. God bless you all for listening, and good night.